Let's see where we're going this morning. 1 Samuel chapter 17 is where we are. And along with that, though, along with that, the story of uh, Matthew that he shared, the baptism, the songs that we sang, are those reminders of what God is doing in our hearts and, and in our lives. It is the very thing that we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks, which is this, the legacy that we are building for our lives the legacy that we are building for our lives. In week one, I kind of asked you the question to go home and send a letter, right? Send a letter to somebody that made an impact in your life. Last week, I asked you, maybe, maybe it's time to do something new or do something again that you haven't done in a long time to put yourself in a posture or a position to learn and to listen to God and to lead as God would want you to lead couple things that we can do as we think about this idea of legacy and the question that we ask, am I living a life that leaves a legacy of faith? Am I living a life that will leave a legacy of my faith? Will my life leave that legacy? That's the question that we're asking ourselves. And the quote that, that, we're, that we're referring to that we keep coming back to from biblical scholar F.F. F. Bruce is simply this. Uh, Bruce says this, their faith consisted simply of taking God at his word and directing their lives accordingly. We looked at, we looked at Hebrews chapter 11 and all the great people of faith, all the great people of faith, if we were going to live our lives and, and do so so that we leave a legacy of faith, who are some people that we could model our lives after or be encouraged by? Uh, the scripture writers told us, look at Hebrews and the writer writes in Hebrews chapter 11, all these names, and Bruce writes, writes this comment, all they did, all they did, when you stop and think about it, all that those people did was they believed God, they trusted him, and they directed their lives accordingly. It's really that simple, but yet it's very complex. They trusted God, they took him at his word, and they lived their lives accordingly. So the challenge for us is, the challenge for us is how do we direct our lives so that we can leave a legacy of faith? How do we direct our lives so that we can leave a legacy of faith? Last week we looked at Samuel. Today we're gonna to look at the story of David. Now, David is one of the most famous uh, characters in scripture. David, David has this, this hero, this hero-like life that we read about. God's, God's favor rests upon David. His covenant is established uh, uh, between God and David. And it's through David's ancestry that Jesus will be, will be born. And so if you grew up in the church, if you grew up in the church, you probably have heard the stories of David, right? Famous stories. Stories of, of war and, and conquest. In fact, his famous victory, his most famous victory, is noted in today's com uh, competitive culture, right? We see this even outside the church. You know the name of the battle, right? Between David and... See, you didn't even need the screen this morning. You knew that. David and Goliath. It's become a, a colloquial reference for, for, for a battle, for a game, or for an encounter where one is overmatched by the other. An underdog versus a giant, a real David versus Goliath matchup is what we see. In fact, author Malcolm Gladwell even used it in, as the, the premise of his 2013 book called David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. God chose David to follow Saul as king because God saw something in him that others didn't see. He's known for his heart that follows hard after God. He's known as a great musician in worship and poetry, some of the, the psalms that we read and that have been turned into music today have come from David. And again, he's known for his great battles that he fought. Those are the stories that we tell. Those are the, those are the passages that we quote. there's another side to David. There's a dark side. There's, there's a shadow side to the life of David. Sometimes, sometimes we tell the shadow stories, sometimes, but we'll probably gloss over it. 
you remember the, the shadow story too, right? The dark side of David. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. We know that story too. Yeah. It's a doozy too. Like if you, if you like read it in context, it's, it's, right? It's out there, right? I mean, some of you used to turn on CBS and you had Dallas and Dynasty, right? Come on, I know. Some of you are watching Yellowstone. And I'm just telling you, this story of David and Bathsheba, not even close to Dallas Dynasty or Yellowstone. Not even close. We don't often tell that story in its context, and when we do, we usually sanitize it for consumption. But when we read it and we put it in the context of David's life, we see a man battling between the temptations of life and the desires of his heart to follow hard after God. We see a man whose legacy of faith was filled with red flags. In the scripture reading that was read for us this morning from 1 Samuel 17, it's the story of David and Goliath as, as David approaches that battle. We've probably, again, many of us growing up in the church have heard that story, and I won't spend the time right now to read, reread that, those verses word for word, but 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 just remember, David was off, uh, the youngest brother, he was off tending the sheep, he heard about the battle, and he kept running to the front lines to see his brothers, to bring supplies, to bring food, and, and to check out what was going on. And, and on one occasion, on one occasion when he came to the front lines, he heard Goliath uh, step out and, and curse Israel and shout down God's name. And, and David had this stirring in his heart, right? Like nobody's going to say that about our God, right? I will stand and fight for God's name. And David goes on and does what David does, right? See, we get, we get all caught up in the battle, don't we? We get all caught up in what David accomplished. We, got, we get all caught up in, in the five smooth stones, right, that he picked up for his slingshot. We get all caught up in that he tried to wear Saul's armor, but Saul's armor wasn't good enough because it, wasn't, it didn't fit him. And that's a great metaphor for another message at another time. And we get caught up in the slingshot and how he, 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 he used a tool that he used to be able to, that he was familiar with, right? Another metaphor that, for a message of another time. We get caught up. We get caught up in the battle scene. We get caught up in the warrior's heart of David, right? Well, I mean, what was the last line? What was the last line of verse 32? David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him, right? Rawr! Right? We get all caught up in the, in the, rawr! we get caught up in the courage to defend the name of the Lord. And all of that is good, and, and all of that is true, and, and all of that matters. All of it. But did you see what else was happening in this story? Did you see David being tossed back and forth in his own heart and in his own spirit? Verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this, this man Goliath keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Verse 26, now remember, David had come to the lines to deliver supplies to his family, to his brothers, right? And David heard this was going on. And as David heard the, the other men say that the king will give great wealth to the man who kills him, he will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes. David hears this. He's going around and it's like he stops for a minute. What do you say? What, what, hang on a second. What happens to the guy who beats Goliath? It's right. I'm not making this up. Verse 26. 
David said, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? And then after he's done fighting with his brother, right? And then Eliab kind of steps in. David, what are you doing here, right? The brother, right? The brothers and the, again, another story for another time, right? Why are you talking like this? You're just conceited in your heart. And David mouths off at his brother and they have this little exchange. And after he does that with his brother, verse 30, what does it say? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. The same matter. What, 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 what's going to happen? Like, what do we get? Let's go back to that, that reward thing. What was that reward thing? I just want to make sure I got it one more time. I get some money. I get a wife who, by the way, is who? Daughter of the king. Hmm. Position. Power. Money. Right? And what about my taxes? Don't tell your CPA. No taxes. Right? Is it possible? Is it possible that part of David's motive to fight Goliath was money and marriage and the power and the position of the king's son-in-law. Is it possible that in one breath, David is defending the honor of God and in the next breath thinking of what he can get out of this situation? I mean, I read it. I'm just saying, in verse 26, right? David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the one who kills the Philistine? And they repeated to him what they'd been saying and told him, this is what will be done. Then Eliab, you know, stuck his nose in it and they had a fight. And in verse 29, in verse verse 29, David said, hey, can I even talk to the people around here? In verse 30, then he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. One time is interesting, right? Oh, that's what the scriptures say. One time is interesting. A second time makes a biblical reader sit up and pay attention a little bit more. The third time it's mentioned makes you dig a little deeper. Okay. The author's trying to tell us something here. David is is caught in this real-time battle between his heart and his spirit and the temporal and the flesh that he lives in day in and day out. Is it possible, is it possible that ignoring this red flag in David's life goes on to haunt him the rest of his life? What was David's downfall? The story of David, what was his shadow story? David and money, position and power as the king to do what he wanted when his lust rose within him. But here's the thing, it's so subtle. This this should have been a red flag. This should have been a warning to his spirit. It check that, that, that he should have paid attention to in his gut, right? I need to pay, mm, mm, I need to pay attention to this, right? We're living our life, we're walking, you know, we're, we're doing our church thing, we're doing our God thing, we've got faith, we're, live, we're being baptized, we're moving forward, and we're living life. We're trying to feed our soul and our spirit, and as we do, we do so living in a very real world that brings real temptation along us. And there are times in our lives when we should pay attention to that check, to that, mm, that I, mm, maybe I should pay attention to that. Maybe I should talk to somebody about that. Maybe I shouldn't lean so far into that. What is my motive? Is my motive pure? Is my motive right? Should I check that in my heart? But it's subtle, isn't it? It feels noble. It feels reasonable, right? 
hey, I'm going to go put my life on the line for God, right? Yeah, there should be some kind of reward. Oh, I'll take that. I'll take that reward. I'll, money? Yeah. Who, who's who's going to push money away, right? Right? You get to marry the king's daughter? That's, you're set for easy street now, right? And no taxes. Like, who looks at that and goes, that's not a bad deal. It's reasonable. It's subtle. And maybe for you and me, it wouldn't have been a big deal, but for David, man, it was a red flag. It's subtle, and because it's subtle, it's never addressed. David's still a man after God's own heart. You keep reading the story of David, get past the story of Goliath, go in through the rest of 1st and 2nd Samuel. David's still after God's heart. David is still, uh, he waits patiently to be the king. He acts honorably and, and justly. He shows kindness and he acts with dignity towards others. He develops his, his worship skills and he writes poetry again that becomes the scriptures that we read and that we sing. David's heart, David's heart is longing for God, but in the next breath, his family is a mess. Read the story. His family is a mess. His marriage is filled with tension. He doesn't simply succumb to temptation. He goes to great lengths to cover it up. Premeditation, dereliction of duty, conduct unbecoming, murder, coercion, lying, and cover up. That's the story of the man who's after God's own heart. That's the story of the man who God tapped on the shoulder and said, you are going to lead my people. That's the story of the lineage of Jesus. Not to mention, not to mention how he treated Bathsheba. We don't talk about that angle, do we? How, how did she feel? in that moment? What was going through her mind? What were her options during this abuse of power? In one breath, he's worshiping God, and in the next breath, he's committing adultery. In one breath, he's crafting the Psalms, and in the next breath, he's plotting a cover-up. In one breath, he's vindicating God's name, and in the next breath, he's soiling his reputation. In one breath, you and I, we sing the songs of the church. What a great worship set this morning, right? In one breath, we sing the songs of the church. And in the next breath, we spew hate on social media. In one breath, we're leading a ministry. And in the next breath, we're caving to our addictions. In one breath, we're praising God for his goodness. And in the next breath, we're verbally abusing our spouse and our children. We're just like David. We live in a broken and fallen world that promises a broken and fallen life. It has consequences and it has outcomes. And they're painful, at least, horrifying at worst. John, in, in his first epistle to his followers of Jesus, reminded us that, that everything in the world, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father. That, that's not from the Father. That, that's from the world. The less connected to the inputs of God that we are, through Jesus and the Holy Spirit of our, in our lives, the more inputs of the world that we, that we bring into our lives. It's an input-output, right? The more connected we are to God, the less of the world, the more connected to the world, the less of God. And the world around us will, will infiltrate us and, and the world around us leads us to, to places in our own minds and in our own hearts and spirits and, 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 and in our steps that we never thought we'd go to. I'll never be that guy. I'll never be that family. But the world is subtle, isn't it? 
The king will give great wealth to the man who kills Goliath. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. David David lived in his sin and its consequences. It's interesting to read if you, in fact, if you keep reading and you read into uh, first, first Kings, the life of Solomon. Solomon, Solomon is, is the child born to David and Bathsheba later down the line. And what's interesting is what scarred Solomon's legacy. I'm going to let you check that out this week. First Kings chapter 11. You'll have to check that out on your own. David lived in avoidance, if not denial for a while. He just stuffed it down, right? I did something I knew I shouldn't do. I lived in a way that I shouldn't live. I know I, I, I've got this check. I've got this red flag that keeps waving in front of my mind and my heart and my spirit. I'm just going to, you know, uh, we're just going to put that over there. You know, I'm just going to go do this now. I'm just going to forget about it. I'm just not going to pay attention to it. And we do that too. We ignore, we, we deflect, we make, we make empty promises, right? It's so subtle. It's so subtle. So what do we do? I mean, what's the good news? Hey, preacher man, it's week three now for you. What's the good news now? Come on, boss. Here's the good news. Two things David did that turned it around as best he could. Two things that David did that began to turn things around. First, he listened to spiritual correction. He listened to spiritual correction. At some point later, it was at least nine months, it was probably longer than nine months, David is, is going about, he has, he, has, he has suppressed what he's done with Bathsheba, he's suppressed that whole thing, he's pushed it aside, you know, hopefully, you know, he's thinking, hey, just give me two weeks and there'll be a new news cycle, right? Something else will pop up, right? We won't have to deal with that, right? We'll just keep going, we'll just keep thinking, right, something else. And so it goes for about nine months, maybe a year, maybe a year, and, and in that time, in that time, again, he was just thinking, nobody's going to remember, nobody knows, nobody knows what I did. And how many of us read this story and be like, bro, everybody knows what you did. Everybody knows. So Nathan comes to him. Nathan is the prophet at the time. Nathan comes to him, and, and it wasn't a political visit, and it wasn't a legal interrogation. This was a spiritual confrontation and correction. Nathan, the spiritual leader, comes to the king. I'd like to think Nathan learned something from Samuel, right? Speak truth to power. Nathan comes to the king and he says, I know what you did. He does it a little more eloquently. He tells a little story. Hey, I got a little story for you, right? This guy has a sheep, right? Remember, you got to look that one up too. And David's like enraged. And he's like, we need to kill that guy. And Nathan looks at him and he goes, you're that guy. And in that moment, David knew. It was a spiritual rebuke. It was spiritual counsel. It was spiritual correction. And it broke him. It broke him. While he always knew in his mind what he did was wrong, here he was convicted of it in his spirit and his heart, he was broken in spirit. Who do we have speaking into our lives that kind of spiritual confrontation? How do we, how do we receive spiritual counsel? Are we open to the work of the Holy Spirit? Are we open to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives or will we just keep moving through life, pushing it aside and ignoring it and saying, I'm okay, I'm just gonna go to church today and sing the songs, don't look over here. All the while, the red flag is waving. Pay attention to this. Pay, and the Holy Spirit whispers our name, doesn't he? Hey, watch this, 
pay attention to this. That little gut check, that's not, that, pay attention to that. Don't let it go too far. Are we worshiping in a way where, where we're sensitive to God's spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to confront us? You see, when David finally was confronted, he was broken and he listened to what God was saying to him. The second thing that David did, he didn't just listen to spiritual correction, but he expressed his remorse. This is when David turned to God in the way that he knew how. Remember a couple weeks ago, I told you, you know, like we're all created by God in different ways and God speaks to us in different ways, right? The same Holy Spirit, but in different ways because of how we're created. I like certain things, you like certain things, right? All the, all the people that experience God in nature, right? Woo-hoo. Right? And then there's like all the people that experience God through music, right? Woo-hoo. And then all the people that experience God, I just want to read a book. I just want to get into the library, right? And read. And it's like, woo-hoo, shh, woo-hoo, right? That, that's fine. Because we're all created in different ways. The same spirit speaks the same truth, but in ways that we can understand. And when we are in a season of remorse, we can express that in the way that God created that. And that's what David did. David sat down. And with his musician's heart and his poetic uh, ability, he sat down and he penned a prayer and poured out his heart before God. And it was the prayer and the confession that we read this morning, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, God. Wash away my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart. Don't, don't cast me from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Can you hear David's plea before God? An authentic and uh, plea before God. I am broken and contrite in spirit. David didn't, just, David didn't just listen to spiritual correction, but he responded to it. Um, he responded to his remorse. He expressed it. And I would say we need to find ways to express to God our remorse. Maybe it's not a song or a poem that we write, but, but maybe it's a prayer that we think about day in and day out. Now, I believe that when we, when we authentically confess our sin to God, the guilt is gone and we are lifted up. We have to live with the consequences. That's just the way it is. But the guilt of that sin is gone. And what I'm saying is not go now and, and stew in the guilt I'm not saying stew in the guilt. I'm saying be remorseful and maybe what helps you grow in your faith and get through the red flag that God has brought up in your life is to keep saying a prayer in your head. This prayer has created me a clean heart, restore a new spirit within me, right? It becomes an exercise that we do to remind ourselves as we meditate on God's word, right? Um, as, as Proverbs tells us, to meditate on God's word, that it becomes an act of worship for us. Maybe there's a song that we listen to and it reminds us of how good God is, God's goodness to us and how he draws close to us. And it just reminds us of our forgiveness and the freedom that we have. Maybe it's something else in a way that you exercise your faith. And so as we close this morning, my prayer is that is that we would have the courage to identify the red flags in our lives. That we would have the courage to pay attention to that little gut check, that little, that little pause in our step, right? That red flag that God waves and says, hey, pay attention to this. Because it's better to pay attention and to deal with it now than it is to try to ignore it and live a life that doesn't walk in the way that God wants us to and we feed the temptation instead of dealing with it. Deal with the flag now before it becomes a problem later. The second thing that that I would encourage us with this morning is this, to be sensitive to God's correction. That maybe even today you're sitting here thinking, yeah, there's that red flag. God keeps waving that been trying to push that away. I just need to deal with that thing. 
Be sensitive to God's correction in your life. And allow, number three, allow remorse to lead to repentance. I pray that the psalm, uh, psalms would be good for us. I pray that Psalm 51 would be a call to find peace with God in Christ. And maybe for you today, it's the first time ever. Maybe for you today, you're like, you know what? I've, I can't keep dealing with this life. I've got to get something different. I've got to change this. I've got to be, I've got to be tuned in to God's correction. I've got to be tuned in to remorse. I've got to find a way to repent of this and just get my life turned around. And maybe today, for the first time, you're like, yep, I'm going to put my faith in Christ. That faith that, that Matthew demonstrated up here, that's what I want. Not that we're going to live this perfectly, but we're going to just, I've got to, I've got to find forgiveness and repentance and just try to move forward. Or maybe for you, it's the first time in a long time today that you say those words. I'm coming home, God. It's time to come home. I'm sorry. And this morning I would ask that we would just keep praying. That we would keep praying for people in our lives. That we would keep praying as a church for our church and for its leaders and for its ministries that we would see the red flags and we would pay attention to them. I pray for our coworkers and our friends and our families. So as our worship team comes to, to lead us in this, this closing song, I, I pray that that would be the attitude of our heart. That if God is leading you in a certain way, today you would say, you know what, today, today's the day I'm going to deal with that red flag. And I'm going to put my trust not in my efforts and my abilities. I'm going to put my trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins and for him to lead my life. Or maybe for the, for, for the first time in a long time, we've got to do it again as an act of repentance. I'm coming back home. I've, I've I've wandered, I've strayed, the red flag, it's, and now it's a bed sheet. It's not a flag, it's a red bed sheet, and it's just waving in my life. i got to take care of that. Or maybe during this song, we're praying for people in our, in our circle of influence or family that need prayer. So as we sing, follow the prompting of God's, God's, God's spirit in your heart.